Peace waits for us at Advent. We join together in this time of preparation. With God, we are invited to create a world that offers healing. Through this good work, peace is born in us again. The peace of Christ be with you. Take off your mourning clothes and oppression, Jerusalem. Dress yourself in the dignity of God's glory forever. Wrap the justice that comes from God around yourself like a robe. Place the Eternal One's glory on your head like a crown. God will show your brilliance everywhere under heaven. God will give you this name by which to be called forever, the peace that comes from justice, the honor that comes from reverence for God. Get up, Jerusalem. Stand on the high place and look around to the east. See your children gathered from the west to the east by the Holy One's word as they rejoice that God has remembered them. I thank my God every time 
I mention you in my prayers. I'm thankful for all of you every time I pray, and it's always a prayer full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed it until now. I'm sure about this. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. I have good reason to think this way about all of you because I keep you in my heart. You are all my partners in God's grace, both during my time in prison and in the defense and support of the gospel. God is my witness that I feel affection for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. This is my prayer, that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this so that you will be able to decide what really matters and so you will be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ. I pray you will then be filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes from Jesus Christ in order to give glory and praise to God. It's very interesting in these weeks of Advent worship services that even though all around us, in our homes, in stores, at the neighbor's house where all the decorations are, it's full on Christmas. Nativities, Santa, snowmen, angels, baby Jesus. And then in here, it's Bible stories that aren't that story. Yes, it's because Advent is a season of preparation for Christmas, and if we read the Christmas story parts of the Bible now, first of all, it wouldn't take that long because it's really just a chapter or so, and then what would we do? There is some stuff about the birth of John the Baptist in Luke, and Matthew has a genealogy and a very short story that basically says Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and all the stuff with shepherds and angels and the census and the manger, that's from Luke. The Gospel of Mark doesn't even mention it. And John, John's Gospel is more concerned with big-picture cosmic theology than any babies. So, in Advent, We read the things that really come before the birth of Jesus, that really prepare the way of the Lord. We read the prophets, promising that salvation will come to God's people someday. Things like the prophet Isaiah, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and he will rule over us, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. And today, we have something really unexpected for this time of year, a reading from the Old Testament book of Baruch, which isn't in some of our Bibles, but it is from the Bible. It's actually a reading for the second Sunday of Advent in year C in the Revised Common Lectionary, if you want to get technical. And the book itself is from what Protestants like 
us call the Apocrypha, although its technical categorization is the Deuterocanonical books, which is tricky to say. And this is a collection of books that were always included in the Old Testament until 1522, when Martin Luther published the Bible in German, he took them out and made them their own little section between the Old and New Testament. But in the medieval church, further back in the early church, further back in Jesus' time, and before that, these books were always part of the scriptures. The book of Baruch is traditionally thought to be written by Baruch, who was the scribe, the personal assistant, and best friend of the prophet Jeremiah. We have the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations, also by Jeremiah, because Baruch was there to write down everything Jeremiah was saying. And it's included in the lectionary because it has this long history of being part of the scriptures as a whole, and because for today it's a beautiful piece of prophetic poetry. Take off your mourning clothes and oppression, Jerusalem. Dress yourself in the dignity of God's glory forever. Wrap the justice that comes from God around you like a robe. Place the eternal one's glory on your head like a crown. God's people will not suffer forever. God's people will see justice, and God's glory will shine on us as a divine reflection. These words are part of the great gift that God has given us in Scripture. These words were a gift to the people who heard them in Jeremiah's time, people who, who were homeless or at least in exile. They had homes such as they were in the land that they were taken to, but they weren't their homes. They were refugees. So they had trauma and sadness about their situation in general, and they had spiritual grief because what they believed was that God's home was where they were from. And now that they're not there anymore, how can God live with us if we don't have a home anymore? Maybe you've noticed people tend to have great pride of place about where they're from. You know how people call the 906 area code God's country or pointing out that you're from Nagani but not Ishpeming. They had this whole understanding of faith wrapped up in a very specific geographical location, that this place in Jerusalem was where God lives. It's a good thing we don't have that same confusion, thinking that our sanctuaries are the only places God lives. And when the ancient Jewish people were taken from their land and no longer in the place where they thought God only lived, that became a huge problem for them. And that problem was still kind of a problem for the early church. They weren't part of a faith tradition that still looked to the temple in Jerusalem as the center of the spiritual universe anymore, but they were kind of spiritual refugees in a way, having left the home of their traditions and customs and observance of the law for the greater good of following Jesus. So their home was no longer a specific place anymore, but it was a home in the Christian community, the church. And the Apostle Paul tries to give them some hope too in his letter to the baby church in Philippi. This little bit of a letter is a rare moment of Paul expressing affection and connection. And usually, we end up approaching anything written by Paul with a little apprehension. Let's just say sometimes he comes on strong. Someone once said that reading his letters is like reading the minutes to church council meetings from the early church, meetings where there was much debate and probably much conflict um, is inferred as you read between the lines. And reading his letters sometimes feels like we're eavesdropping on someone else's argument because we weren't at that meeting ourselves. And it's never quite an argument that we are involved in either. We ourselves 
don't really have opinions about eating food that was previously sacrificed to idols, for example, but we do have opinions about unity and the extent of God's grace. So we read the letters, which, by the way, God's grace is complete, sufficient, and endless. And all the topics and debates in Paul's letters still have some connection to us, but maybe sometimes the way Paul says them isn't always seeming so friendly. So it's rare to read something like this breath of fresh air that he offers in Philippians. He says, I thank God for you. I'm glad about you. I feel affection for you. And you say to yourself, who is this guy? This is Paul? He's usually so mm, opinionated, let's just say. But this, this is a love letter. Paul is in love with the church, and even though they have their issues sometimes, he loves them dearly. And so if you are looking for a place that feels like home, the church, as Paul is connected to it in Philippians, is it, my friends. This is my prayer, he writes, that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this so that you will be able to decide what really matters. So today, peace comes to us in the form of the prophet's hope. Stand on the high place and look to the east, Baruch writes. See your children gathered from the west to the east by the Holy One's word as they rejoice that God has remembered them. They aren't lost. We aren't lost. We are home by God's grace with the Holy already housed in us, not in a place. And in Paul's love for his church is more peace. He says, I'm thankful for you every time I pray, and it's always a prayer full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed until now. Amen. Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's joy and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire. In this moment, we open the doors of our hearts to honesty before God about what we've done and left undone that created less hope in a hurting world. Let us breathe out this regret and breathe in the life-giving, forgiving Spirit of God. In this moment, we open the doors of our lives to the call of the Spirit, inviting us to become more than we can imagine. Let us breathe out our fear 
and breathe in the courage of the Spirit of God. In this moment, we open the doors of this church, filling it with the compassion of Christ for all those who are struggling. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We hope you're enjoying Pod Church. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and be notified each time there's a new video. Send your pictures of Doors of Hospitality to Pastor Christopher, hints at mqthope.com, and we'll be glad to share them with everyone. Here are the in-person Advent events for Marquette Hope this Advent season. We hope you're able to join us, if you're able, at any one of these. Join us for Bible study Tuesdays at 10 a.m. via Zoom. Replays are available if you can't make it on this YouTube channel. To learn more about everything that's happening in and around Marquette Hope, check out our Facebook page. You can also get our newsletter on the Facebook as well. Some scholars have wondered if the inn and its keeper were part of Joseph's family. After all, he went back to his hometown for the census. Or perhaps Joseph's own family did not or could not make room for them and they had to look elsewhere for a place to lay their heads. As many of us know, family can be complicated. We'll never know the real circumstances of Joseph's family relations, but the story can help us gain deeper compassion for what we do know. Too many people experience rejection, even from family. What if we endeavored to be family to those who need it most, to house the holy in ways we have not yet imagined? May God's doors of welcome swing open into your heart and into your life. May Christ's humble first dwelling remind you of the plenty you already know. And may the Spirit lead you into more possibility and hospitality than you can imagine making room in the inn for all. May it be so for you. May it be so for us. May it be so for this church. Amen. Church is the weekly online worship of Marquette Hope, a United Methodist faith community located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Find us at facebook.com slash mqthope, mqthope.com, and on YouTube.